Okay. Um, welcome to the back end of our first discussion on our decomposition lab. Um, again, this is the Life Lab investigation. Uh, this is just to finish up the PowerPoint that we were going through the other day, touching on the purpose of decomposition, what, what utility is it in natural systems. And the bottom line is it's to release building blocks that living systems need in order for life to perpetuate itself. We went through the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle uh, when we were in class uh, last time we were together. And this is just a little bit on the hydrologic or water cycle. So take a listen. All the many different substances around us, none is more important, none more vital to our survival. Without water there can be no life, no farms on which to grow our food, no cities or towns know anything, in fact, but the bare base rock from which our planet is made. At first glance, it might seem that, when it comes to water, we're in great shape, that there's more than enough to meet our many needs for it. Seen from space, the Earth looks to be awash with water, which, in fact, it is, with more than 70% of its surface covered with oceans, seas, lakes, bays, and other such bodies of water. There is, however, one serious problem, as far as we humans are concerned, with most of this water. It's the wrong kind. It's salt water. Now, that may be just fine for the fish and other organisms that live in it, but it doesn't do us humans much direct good. We're different. We need fresh water. Fresh, salt-free water to drink, to run our businesses and industries, and to irrigate our crops. And we need lots of it. The amount of fresh water we need for even the simplest tasks is truly amazing. Take, for example, that morning shower. Just five minutes or so in it can use 25 gallons or better of the hundred or more gallons of fresh water each of us uses around our home every day. And then there's breakfast. Well, believe it or not, every egg we eat takes about 125 gallons of fresh water to produce. Then, how about watering the lawn for five minutes or so? Well, that will use up another 50 gallons or more of fresh water. And then, you're off in your car. A car that took some 100,000 gallons of water to manufacture. Plus, another 30,000 gallons or so to make its four tires. So, as you can see, these and all our many other uses for it add up quickly to the need for lots and lots of fresh water. And just where does all this fresh water, all the millions and millions of gallons we need, come from? Well, the world's oceans are no direct help. True, they do contain nearly all the Earth's water supply. But as we said earlier, ocean water is the wrong kind of water for us. It's salt water, water we can't drink water we can't use to irrigate our crops. The truth is, only a tiny part of the world's water, only about 3% of it, is fresh water, the kind we so desperately need. And most of this, some two-thirds of it, in fact, isn't available because it's locked up in glaciers, ice caps, or deep underground. 
That leaves less than 1%, less than one one-hundredth of the water on the planet to take care of all the world's many needs for fresh water. And on top of that, the water we have today is all we'll ever have. Or for that matter, all the earth ever had. That's because, for all practical purposes, no new water is ever created. The water that's with us today is all there ever will be. So as you can see, when it comes to water, it's definitely a case of what we see is what we've got. It's that simple. Obviously then, if so little fresh water is available, and if what there is is so very important to us and so many other organisms, what happens to the world's fresh water supply is all important. And that brings up an interesting question. If there's so little fresh water available, just how is it that the earth didn't run out long ago? How, considering all its many uses, is it that there's any left today? The answer is recycling. The Earth's water supply is naturally recycled, naturally used and reused. Thus water molecules are used time and time again, as they have been since early on in our planet's long history. We call this natural recycling process the water cycle. And in its simplest form, it involves the movement of water molecules from oceans and other sources up into the atmosphere, where many of them clump together to form clouds. Later, these water molecules fall back to Earth as rain, snow, or some other precipitation. Finally, they flow into streams and rivers for their return trip to the ocean where the cycle began and will begin again. Like every other system, the water cycle needs energy to keep it running. This energy comes from the sun. The sun's energy warms the Earth's oceans, rivers, lakes, and other waters. It's this solar heating that causes water molecules in the form of invisible water vapor to evaporate up into the atmosphere. This sun-powered evaporation also works as a natural distillation process, leaving the salts in the ocean water behind, thus replenishing the world's fresh water supply. But the world's oceans and other bodies of water aren't the only source of atmospheric water. Evaporation from wet soil also adds water to the atmosphere, as do plants. Plants take in water from the soil in which they grow. Later, some of it, in the form of water vapor, passes out of the plants through tiny holes in their leaves. Called transpiration, this process adds huge amounts of water to the atmosphere. Trees, for example, can give off hundreds of gallons of water a day. But if you think that's a lot, here's a source of far more. A cornfield. Believe it or not, an acre of corn can pump 4,000 or more gallons of water a day up into the atmosphere. So far, we've examined the water cycle's upside the evaporation that takes place from oceans and other bodies of water, and transpiration from plants. But as we all know, what goes up comes back down. This return trip begins as clouds form when the water vapor in the atmosphere cools and condenses into tiny drops of liquid water. Over time, this falls back to Earth as rain or some other precipitation. Most of it falls into the world's oceans, rivers, lakes, and other such bodies of water. The rest falls on land. Some of this then immediately evaporates back up into the atmosphere. Much of the rest runs into streams and rivers, after time flowing back to the sea. Other precipitation soaks into the ground 
and becomes part of the groundwater supply. Eventually, much of this seeps underground into streams and rivers, thus joining them for their return trip to the sea. With this return to the ocean, the water cycle, that never-ending circulation of the Earth's water supply, is complete and ready to begin again, as it always has and always will. Okay, um, what affects decomposition in soils? And we can look at the type of vegetation, the moisture content, the temperature, the acidity, and the toxins. What we have to understand um, is that the microbes, the fungi, and the insect population, along with the nematodes, the worms, are responsible for breaking down physically the um, components of dead and decaying organisms. And in addition to that, um, chemical breakdown results ultimately in the extraction of all the possible remaining energy um, in components like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, um, and the generation now of oxidized um, building blocks or building blocks which have substantially less energy. Um, in the case of carbon, it ends up as carbon dioxide. In the case of nitrogen containing compounds such as proteins and nucleic acids, uh, we generate soluble nitrogen compounds in the form of nitrates and nitrites as well as ammonium, uh, which are coupled of course with, in the case of ammonium, hydrogen, nitrates and nitrites are nitrogen bound to oxygen, and they're both water soluble. In addition, uh, we make a considerable amount of nitrogen gas, which goes back into the atmosphere, and which, as you remember from the nitrogen cycle video, is unavailable for um, biological use because it is not water soluble. It has to be fixed by um, either the action of lightning or by nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil and in the nodules of legumes. There's a considerable amount of water that's released as a result of these processes as well, and that re-enters the groundwater, the surface water, and of course the atmosphere. But these processes are all primarily um, physical uh, in the case of, um, for instance, the action of insects on leaf litter, uh, just as one example, but primarily chemical when we get down to breaking the macromolecules into their component parts and then sucking the energy out of them. And as a result, it's not a surprise that changes in things like temperature and pH, as well as the presence or absence of toxins and the amount of moisture, um, is going to play a major role in the rate of decomposition. Um, moisture is important because in order for chemical reactions to occur, they have to be in a fluid medium. Water allows molecules to collide into each other and um, these reactants then can generate products without sufficient moisture, chemical reactions are going to be considerably slower. Temperature is going to affect the rate of decomposition. Um, the colder the temperature, the slower the decomposition. Temperature as it increases will increase the rate of decomposition up to a point and at the point where the temperature actually begins to um, break down those molecules that help chemical reactions happen, which are called enzymes, then the rate of decomposition will begin to slow. The same is true with changes in pH. If the pH is too high or too low, you're going to affect the molecules that help chemical reactions happen, and the result is that the rate of decomposition 
will be considerably slower. And toxins also play a role in inactivating enzymes and in some cases um, actually killing off bacteria and fungi uh, and insects that facilitate the decomposition process. So what we're looking at in this next slide is uh, a little primer on the uh, components that affect soil decomposition. So take a listen. Hi Al. I wanted to talk to you about how soil is made. Now we spoke before about how rocks erode to kind of create soil. And what you get is kind of a sand kind of thing like this. But that's not what we really uh, think about as soil. Uh, what's missing there is something else. Take a look at this. Now this is nice, good black dirt. The difference is besides the little pieces of rock and sand that's there, there's also organic matter. Organic matter is anything living or that came from something living. So for example, a leaf. Now this is a dead leaf that's fallen. Eventually this gets broken down and becomes a part of mixes with the sand and becomes part of this darker soil. So as it gets broken down, it might start to look like this, and then the pieces get so small you can't even tell they're there anymore. So how does a leaf go from something like this to that? Well, it needs some help. One of the things that does it is bacteria. Bacteria eats away at the, uh, the organic matter and breaks it down into very, very small pieces. But even before bacteria get started, there's organisms called detritivores. Now we'll talk later about why they're called that, but here's some examples. Here's a detritivore. What he does is he's got a really tiny mouth, and at night he comes up and eats at the leaf and any other dead grass, things like that, and eventually it looks like this. But you know whatever goes in this end has to come out this end. And that, those small particles, become a part of the soil or get broken down by bacteria and become a part of the soil. Another example of a detritivore is something like this. Now this is a giant cockroach, not something that you normally see around here, but he's an example of the types of beetles and bugs and millipedes that eat dead organic matter, cause it to break down, and then become a part of soil. Hope that helps, Al. Okay, now our method that we're going to be using to examine the rate of decomposition is this alkali jar. So what happens here is that we take the soil and the grass clippings, we treat it with, in the case of your controls, distilled water, um, in the case of your blank, there's nothing in here but water. Uh, and in the case of your treatment, we have the grass clippings and the soil and your treatment solution. Okay, This is where the decomposition actually takes place. And what it does, as the com organic components break down, is that we generate carbon dioxide, which we can use as a method to determine the rate at which decomposition occurs. The carbon dioxide is the result of a chemical process called respiration in which living systems take carbohydrates, combine them with oxygen, and they produce carbon dioxide and water, quite a bit of energy for them to use in order for them to reproduce, grow, and repair, and also a considerable amount of heat. The carbon dioxide in our decomposition system is going to be trapped in this airtight container and captured by the alkali solution. And so at the end of several weeks, what we're going to do is remove this alkali solution, cap it, and then we're going to try and determine the amount of carbon dioxide captured through the use of a color indicator and a method, chemical method called titration, where essentially what we'll do is we'll, we'll add some um, barium chloride to the solution and then um, we'll hit it with a color indicator, phenolphthalein, and then we will titrate with um, a weak acid solution in order to determine um, what pH the solution 
uh, is currently at. Okay, so titration is a way of quantifying the amount of carbon dioxide captured. The way that we'll know um, when we've reached the, the titration point is when there's a color change in the solution. The phenolphthalein is going to be sort of a reddish violet at alkali conditions, and it will turn clear once we pass the neutral pH of 7. And what you'll do is measure the amount of hydrochloric acid it took to reach that titration point, and you can then, using a chemical equation, determine how much carbon dioxide um, was, was captured by the sodium hydroxide as a result of the acid used in your titration. And we'll show you how to do that um, in the second um, part of the lab, which is going to happen um, in several weeks. Okay, So just remember, the alkali solution catches the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is the result of cellular respiration. Um, and the entire system is humidified and closed to the outside so that we don't lose our CO2 to the atmosphere and we also don't bring in other gases that would interfere with our analysis. So that's why we had to seal those jars up so tight. And important, let's write the equation for um, respiration up here. It's C6 H12 Forgive me this writing with this tool here. O6, that's glucose, that's the formula for glucose. You combine that with six molecules of oxygen. Oxygen is a diatomic molecule, so we indicated O2. And then we're going to generate six molecules of water. And also six molecules of CO2. We'll also produce energy. So we'll put a big E here for energy. Energy. And we'll also produce heat. We'll indicate that by a little triangle. Okay. And what you'll notice about this chemical equation is it's a balanced equation. There's the same number of atoms on the left side as on the right side. So we have conservation of matter. That's the first law of thermodynamics is that matter can't be created or destroyed, only interconverted. Um, and um, the net effect, again, is to produce um, energy-poor compounds, water and carbon dioxide. The energy that's locked in the carbohydrate, the glucose, ends up serving the organism so that it can grow and repair. Okay. So we'll determine how different environmental factors affect decomposition in soils. Um, the factors that we tested were salinity, that was the set of jars where we used our um, sodium chloride solution to soak the, the soil and the grass clippings. And we also did one with pH, where we used a dilute acid solution to soak the grass clippings in the soil. Um, you'll set these incubation jars up according to the lab handout, which we did the other day, uh, using a pipette to proportion out the sodium hydroxide solution, the treatment solutions, and the water. Um, and then when we get ready to pull those jars and do our titrations, that's when we'll actually determine um, what the effect of your treatments were on the rate of decomposition. So this is what your system would normally look like, okay? Uh, your treatment jar is going to have your grass clippings and your soil and your, um, your treatment solution, okay, whether it was a salt treatment or an acid treatment, depending on your group. You're going to have that scintillation vial, that small glass vial filled with the sodium hydroxide. That's going to capture the carbon dioxide. You've got a paper towel with water to keep the chamber humidified, and then you've got an airtight seal, either from saran wrap or screw top, to keep the air out so that we keep our carbon dioxide inside the jar. Your control is going to contain um, the grass clippings and the soil and the distilled water, 
and the scintillation vial with the sodium hydroxide and the moistened towelette. And then finally the blank um, was going to contain just the water and um, the sodium hydroxide in the scintillation vial and then we seal that up airtight and that's going to serve essentially as our background okay there will be some carbon dioxide that's going to be captured even in the blank as well as in the control uh, and these are going to serve as a, a baseline of comparison to determine um, whether or not the treatment had a statistically significant effect on the decomposition rate, okay? So um, in a nutshell, um, that's the experimental setup. Remember that we have to do at least three replicates for each, the treatment, the control, and the blank in order for our results to be statistically valid and not due to simply to changes of random chance. Um, and we'll pool those data when we're ready to um, take the experiment down and determine whether or not your treatment had an effect on the rate of decomposition, okay? So I'll see everybody in class um, when we meet again on Thursday, and we'll be doing a quick lab on inter- and intraspecific competition. Shouldn't take nearly as long as it did to set up this experiment. And um, make sure and watch this podcast because the material here will be covered on the quiz. Um, and I will see everybody uh, in class. Thank you very much.